Hello everyone. Um, today I want to talk about uh, men crying, right? And we have been inundated as MGTOW with messages of man up, be stoic, do not show emotion, do not show compassion, do not show any feelings. The question that I want to pose to you gentlemen is do real men cry? Such is the question that I want to address in this video. Since our society seems to have already spelled out an answer on behalf of men without, of course, consulting them for their opinion. Uh, Western society seems to have very little use or patience for men crying or even non-adult males crying in general. From the very beginning of the human male being's life, we strap him down in restraints and mutilate a part of his body in a way that we would never think of doing to infant girls. Now, I'm always skeptical of these studies uh, that purport to measure such specific behavior and thus I ask you to take this uh, with a bit of a grain of salt here but uh, this is going to be in the description box uh, I'm citing a study here that shows that mothers tend to respond preferentially to girls versus boys at birth all the way up to about 44 weeks uh, and this is at a time when infant boys need their mother's comfort the most and fathers, uh, of course, are usually expected to simply function as a 50 plus hour work week bill payer and likely get even less time to spend with their sons. Now, I, I distinctly remember an ex coworker of mine and I were having a conversation uh, and the conversation surrounded uh, his newborn infant daughter. He was about two months into raising her and I, you know, having not known about the new addition to his young family until that day, offered him my congratulations and this is all just you know small talk this is how co-workers talk sometimes we just make small conversation like this but he took it as an opportunity to tell me how excited he was about having a baby girl and how he had always wanted this right now i did happen to know that he had a three-year-old boy already and i asked him if he saw any discernible differences between what it was like to have a newborn boy versus a newborn girl and what he said back to me was something that stuck with me uh, to this day. And what he said to me uh, has stuck with me uh, all these years later. This was a while ago uh, because it was so shocking. What he said was, and I'm going to try to uh, quote it ver verbatim here. He said, and we're going to call him Tom. He went on to explain to me that he saw very few differences in the way they behave. Uh, both were essentially helpless infants that cried and pooped and slept and ate and really did very little else. But when it came to the topic of crying, uh, he said the following. He said, my boy cried very little, even less than his girl did at that age. But with my boy, there was something in me, as much as I loved him, that just wanted to let him cry sometimes. I would find myself, he said, saying, you know, you need to man up, little man. And, of course, we're talking about a months-old infant boy here. An infant who couldn't possibly understand the concept of manning up or even the concept of what it means to be a man or a woman. He was simply, at that point, a human bundle of responses to primitive emotions and drives. If he's hungry, he cried. If he felt physical pain, he cried. If he felt emotional pain, he cried. And that's all they really know how to do. Uh, of course, you know, he can maybe laugh or whatever uh, and see if that gets him attention. But for the most part, when babies are in distress, they cry. Now, I don't think uh, my friend Tom was a bad person. Uh, he himself showed many instances of generosity to some of our coworkers that I, you know, definitely would not have extended. I think overall, he wasn't a bad person. I think overall, he was a good person. But like his own infant son, I believe that he was socialized, essentially from birth, to, you know, man up in one way or another, and was simply passing it along to his own son because that's all that he knew. In his mind, I really believe that he believed that he was doing his son a favor by getting him started early in the process of readying him for a world that is uncaring in terms of male suffering. Now, we as MGTOW, we tend to explore the seemingly uh, inherent biological characteristics of the male human being that lead him to exhibit behaviors that would indicate that men are on some level naturally gynocentric and naturally tend to put their own interests as well as the interest of other men like them beneath those of the women they interact with. I think that this is something that we should continue to explore, but for now, uh, I want to focus on only the socialized aspects of the man-up mentality boys are subjected to, uh, and even infant boys are subjected to uh, from early age in our society. With that said, I wish to clarify my position that it is very likely impossible to tease out the two. Uh, the reasons we are less tolerant of crying from the male sex of our species in comparison to the female sex 
uh, likely have their origins in biology, uh, causing us to reinforce it on a sociological level. But to the degree that we can explore the socialized aspects of it, I certainly think it's worth pursuing. Now, it's very likely that our species evolved crying for the same reasons, you know, puppies are cute and kittens are adorable. Uh, a puppy is helpless. It makes cute little sounds and noises and gestures that we naturally react to. And it has enough of a neotenous appearance so as to coax us towards reacting to it in a helpful manner. And that distinction is important uh, because our species may very well have some kind of boy who cried wolf mechanism nestled in our psychology that protects us from people using the power of crying, which is essentially the ability to immediately draw attention and sympathy from almost everyone around you for nefarious purposes. And this mechanism, if it exists, like many other evolutionary adaptations, is imperfect and designed for a type of existence that the human species simply does not exist in anymore. But the, the myth of the boy who cried wolf may give us a bit of insight into how all of this work. Myths are, after all, mimetic manifestations of how the human species views itself, and they usually attempt to teach us something, right? And this myth, the boy who cried wolf, tells us of a boy who repeatedly made false claims of sighting a wolf in the village, catalyzing an unnecessary village-wide reaction by the townsfolk in defense of the sheep. Now, once he made the false claim, and then again he made it, and then again, until the villager simply learned to disregard his false alarms. And finally, one day, a wolf did come, and the boy cried wolf, but of course it was considered to be a false alarm and nothing else. The wolf ended up slaughtering all of the sheep, and it is there that the moral of the story is found. The moral of the story is, do not lie, don't raise false alarms, only draw upon the help of others, when it is absolutely necessary, if you want the continued help of others. Now, I suspect that for as long as we exist as a species, humanity will churn out very little parables and myths that convey something along the lines of the girl who cried wolf. You know, in the parable of the girl who cried wolf, we would see the villagers respond no matter how many times the girl cried wolf, and if there ever was a girl shepherd who managed not to cry wolf at all, she would be held up as a hero no matter how many boys accomplished the same feat. Boys, and the men they later become, have less helplessness, less neoteny to draw upon to elicit sympathy from both men and women. You know, they may have the hardware that allows them to cry, but the lack of the neoteness hardware that allows us to act with sympathy toward them at anywhere near the level that we do for the female sex is lacking. And I think this helps to explain why there is such a problem with false rape accusations today. You know, why women can essentially point a finger at a man, falsely accuse him of rape or pretty much any other charge. And no matter how many false rape accusation scandals occur, you know, how many uh, mattress girls or Rolling Stone magazine debacles, she is to be believed without question. The, you know, the quote village that makes up Western society and civilization is so obsessed with female safety and the possibility of attending to female suffering that they can't bring themselves to not drop everything they're doing and take up their torches and pitchforks for the girl who cries rape, no matter how many times they get there and find out that no male wolf is out there doing any raping. You know, I know that citing anecdotal references to popular culture is far from scientific and I'm, I'm not pretending otherwise here. Uh, but I think the purpose of this video isn't to uh, cite some all-encompassing scientific study to prove this to you. The purpose is more to raise the question of why we treat a crying man so much differently than a crying woman. Uh, studies can come later based off the preliminary answers we arrive at in speculation uh, to the questions posed here. Now, one of the most popular television series in the world, that is AMC's The Walking Dead, follows the post-zombie apocalypse struggles of one Rick Grimes and his son Carl and the rest of his crew to survive while the rest of the world has gone to shit. And one scene in particular, following Rick's son having to kill his own mother after she gave birth to his sister, unfolds with Carl telling uh, his father Rick that his wife was dead. Now what follows is very important, I think. Uh, you see Rick, who is seen as the undisputed leader of the group, having a breakdown, you know, chock full of uncomfortable, guttural, and decidedly not cute crying. Uh, it was the type of crying that only men do, and only during periods of intense suffering. The type of crying that sounds, you know, almost animal-like. And I'm going to put a link to that in the description box for those of you that want to watch that, and it's important that you do. Uh, you won't understand what I'm describing uh, in the rest of this video if you don't. 
Now, after watching that, uh, I want you to notice how this scene unfolded. It's very important to note the bewildered scene of the faces of Rick's comrades. Because up until that point, they had perceived him literally as an emotionless being, right? Stoic, unflinching, uh, and ever stable. And they built their conceptualization of safety and stability around his ability to stay calm and collected. And frankly, they didn't very much care about the pressure it put on him. So long as he continued to maintain composure, so long as he continued to provide that, they were happy to allow that pressure to just keep building and building and building. And this is how we see the breakdown of many of a man in our society that can only take so much and may very well be extremely competent, extremely intelligent, but at a certain point, even the best of us, the pressure will build and we will crack. And that explains the reactions of his comrades who are shown, and I really want you to watch this, they're, they're just shown averting their gaze, making no efforts to comfort him, and frankly looking very uncomfortable themselves. It's almost as if they were offended that he would dare burst their bubbles with an expression of vulnerability and suffering. And I know this is just a television show, but I believe that this show has risen to become so popular because it tells us about ourselves and who we are. Right? The zombies are nice, sure, but after a season or two, the novelty of that fades for all but the most hardcore you know, horror, makeup, and special effects gurus. What keeps us watching and what keeps us coming back to The Walking Dead is the reaction we see from these people in situations where it basically just boils down to pure survival. You know, in the Walking Dead universe, it's back to the basics for humanity, and we're very curious to see whether or not our behaviors would match up to those of the unfortunate denizens of the Walking Dead universe if we found ourselves in their situations. Right? We see these characters do something, we see them have to make decisions, whether they be emphatic or selfish, and we wonder whether we would be selfish or emphatic as well. We watch The Walking Dead for realism in an unreal fictional world. And with that said, it should be no surprise uh, to you that after this episode aired, uh, the internet kind of went wild with uh, ridicule for Rick Grimes' awkward crying scene, and from that a new internet meme was born. And we'll call that the, the crying Rick Grimes meme, and I'm sure you guys have seen it before on the internet. Uh, but if not, I'll just post some examples here. And basically, as you can see, uh, it boiled down to ridicule. It boiled down to the trivialization of when a man who is suffering cries. Now, I have to take a moment to let you know that I do not have a problem with this meme proliferating. My intent uh, is not to show that the media should, you know, portray crying men in a better light or any of that kind of Sarkeesian level nonsense. I'm actually glad that the internet does this. I'm glad that wider society views male crying and suffering as something that elicits a cringe reflex and ridicule. I'm glad that this is the case because it reveals to us what wider society thinks about men and their feelings, once again. It reveals to us that we are expected to hold it together at all times, to remain stoic, and to never show outward signs of emotion. And I think that this is something that men need to know. It tells us our place, right? It tells us our place in the universe and through the knowledge of this, we can react accordingly and perhaps choose even to stop being so damned disposable for a society that mocks our own suffering. Now, this remains to be seen. It's a tall order indeed, but an interesting video surfaced in Japan, of all places, that may offer some hope that a society can potentially accommodate men crying in a way that is not dripping with man-up shaming. And the video, which is going to be in the description box as well, and you need to watch this, it's taken from a dig post titled, quote, Where Japanese Men Go to Cry. And it talks about how Japanese men are seeking out the practice of ryukatsu. I'm, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, I know. Uh, in English, uh, it, it translates literally to tear-seeking. Uh, in reaction to their 60-hour work weeks, followed oftentimes by post-work employee bonding activities at bars, Japanese men have taken to finding public places where they can gather together and uh, I guess it boils down to have a, have a long, refreshing, restorative, weeping cry. So again, I want you to watch that video. Uh, one of the men in the video stated the following in reaction to these uh, Ryokatsu sessions. Uh, and, and by the way, they typically just consist of watching sad movies or short evocative clips uh, with others in, in, in order to, I, I guess, stimulate the production of, of tears and sadness. And he said, quote, uh, this is very interesting, he said, quote, I feel so much better. It's really great. 
I'm always so tense at home and of course in front of my subordinates at work. I find myself getting into a new mental and emotional state, end quote. I don't doubt his claim. Holding back your need to cry for extended periods of time, even years at a time in the case of men, is bound to have some sort of deleterious effect on your health. If you think about what is occurring in your body, your body is essentially telling you to have this reaction. Your body is in such a state of mental agony that it is telling you to cope by expelling tears and sobs. To resist that is simply counter to a healthy human experience. And when you think about the fact that men can sometimes go decades without crying or even shedding a tear and, and are encouraged to do so by society, it then begins to dawn on you how emotionally deprived they really are. It's really a recipe for emotional dysfunction that will eventually, and I dare to say invariably, lead uh, to health problems. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that, you know, we die earlier. Now, as much as you guys are going to hate me for it, um, I do want to bring up in this video, I want to take a journey into the deepest recesses of materialistic pop culture. 